I was, no kidding, minding my own business in Afghanistan in 2010. I was a chaplain for a reconnaissance group, and what our guys did is they climbed way up into the hills of Afghanistan in the mountains along small goat trails, and they would find little holes in the mountain that they would then crawl into and inevitably find large caches of Taliban weapons and explosives. Now, you can imagine how angry the Taliban is when our guys found them, because you know what they did when we found them? We blew them up. In fact, one of my favorite pictures is of one of my rangers saluting as there is a huge explosion going off behind him. Now, I can't confirm behind the podium whether or not he was saluting with all of his fingers, but you can understand the sentiment that soldiers sometimes express uh, when they've, they've had a great victory. While I was on our forward operating base, I had a young soldier run up to me panting and said, Chaplain, the commander needs to see you in the talk, the Tactical Operations Center, as quickly as possible. So I ran with him to the talk. And when I came in, it was all a buzz, and people were on several different radio channels um, talking for additional aircraft and possible air support. And um, there was a sense of dread that hung over the entire room. The commander looked at me and said, Chaplain, here's the situation. We have a team that's waiting for exfiltration. It's waiting to get out of the area that they are in, and they just blew up the largest cache of weapons and explosives that we have found to date. It made quite a noise. And we are sure that the Taliban is angry and moving in on their position as we speak. The problem is, is we can't get vehicles up to get them out. And weather has moved in, so we've lost visibility to bring in helicopters. We have tried everything we know how to do, but we're down to you. We need you to pray. No pressure, right? <laughs> and I wish in retrospect, I would have had my Moses moment, right? That, that I would have walked to the front of the Tactical Operations Center and extended my hands over the monitors and in the radios and began to pray. But the truth is, is I was scared to death. I wasn't quite sure what to do. So I took a deep breath and I stepped out of the talk for just a second. And when I did, I ran into another captain who was a prayer warrior and a fierce man of faith. I explained to him the situation. And then we fell on our knees outside of that tent and began to pray. We prayed to keep the Taliban away. We prayed for their weapons to malfunction. We prayed for weather to come in and move um, the fog out of the way so our helicopters could get in. We prayed for everything we could think of until we were interrupted by the roar of helicopter engines whirring up. I run back into the tactical operations center and my commander is flabbergasted. He says, Chaplain, I don't know what you did, but a wind came in and just blew all the fog out of the area where we need to get our guys. The helicopters are on their way. I wonder how often I am just like that commander in the battles in my life. I am facing impossible circumstances and I am going through all of my training, all of my strength, all of my know-how until my wife finally asks me, did you pray about it? Why is it that maybe you're like me too, that we are so slow to pray? I've spent so many times praying for soldiers before they go into battle that sometimes I think I have forgotten that prayer isn't what we do to prepare for the battle. Prayer is the battle. And so today, Moses and Joshua show us that prayer is the essential domain to fight our battles. Here's the context. They've, Moses has just crossed the Red Sea 
They're fleeing Egypt. They're wandering around in the desert. They've gotten to a place where they've run out of water and they're really upset with God and threatening to kill Moses. But God comes through in a miracle where he strikes the rock and water is provided for his people once again. This is amazing, God's grace. Instead of smiting the people when they were complaining and claiming that he had abandoned them, he smites a rock that pours forth salvation to his people. In another foreshadowing of God's goodness and the plan that is to come. But right on the heels of all of this, we find Israel goes to war for the first time with the Amalekites. So if you'll turn with me to Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, we'll jump right in to God's word. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur were on the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hand up one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands are made steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, and the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So the first lesson that Israel learns to their surprise is Israel is at war. Now, I don't mean to be obvious but it's a really important lesson we all need to learn. If you are at war, it's really important that you know it, right? It changes your whole perspective. It changes your entire intensity of what you do every day. The enemy wants to wipe Israel off the face of the planet and uses despicable, cowardly tactics, attacking the elderly and the sick, kidnapping their women and children. Does any of this sound familiar? And you can read all about that if you want to in Deuteronomy chapter 25. But the lesson that I want us to learn today, church, is do you know that you have an enemy too? That you and I are at war and we serve a God at war. In fact, from the very beginning in Genesis, the Hebrew ear will hear that we are at war and that we're in a war-torn battle zone. The Bible tells us that a war has been going on since before creation. In Genesis 1 and 2, it says the the earth was formless and void. The, The Hebrew words there are tohu vavohu, and they're only used two other places in Scripture. And do you know what they describe? A war torn battlefield. And so the implication is, is that in the beginning, we are entering into a conflict that's been going on before we were even in existence and before we as a people were created. That there was a spiritual battle going on and then the waters that the Spirit of God hovered over in Hebrew poems represented the embodiment of evil forces. Kind of changes your perspective on what's going on in Genesis 1, doesn't it? When you realize that there is this chaos in the midst of battle. You know, Peter tells us that we have an enemy. He says, be alert, 
For your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. I don't think he could be any more explicit when he says, church, stay alert, stay alive. You have a real enemy that's trying to kill you. If you are in a war, you need to understand it. It changes everything. The United States was at war on September 10th, 2001. But we didn't take it seriously. We had had embassies bombed and attacked, but we continued to live our life as if everything was normal until the next day on September 11th when our perspectives changed everything. Church, we are a people at war. One of the largest problems in the Uvalde school shooting was that in the investigations and the interviews of the staff members, it was found that the staff didn't take their security precautions seriously. They thought that locking doors was a hassle that really didn't need to be put up with, and so they just barricaded them open so they could freely come in and out of the school. They didn't believe that there was really an enemy out there that wanted to kill their children. One of the things that breaks my heart as a soldier is the fact that there were two civilians that encountered that school shooter before he entered the building. They were shot at and ran away. Why? Because they were scared and they didn't realize that they were at war. Can you imagine how that would have ended differently if two soldiers would have come up to that vehicle where that school shooter had crashed in? If they were shot at, the soldiers would have done what? Returned fire. That problem and that conflict would have ended right there with men or women that understood that they were at war and they had a real enemy. Today, I want to challenge us to realize that we have a real enemy and what we do here when we praise and when we sing and we proclaim the truth is an act of war to the principalities and the kingdom of this world. All warfare is spiritual. Sometimes it's physical too. But the other thing that we have to understand is all war is spiritual. And so we need to make sure that we are fighting spiritual wars with spiritual weapons. And prayer is our primary spiritual weapon that we go to war with. This might be why scripture tells us to pray without ceasing because we live in a combat zone. I have a friend that frequently lives in a combat zone. He's an old Green Beret and he's always finding himself in pretty crazy situations. Even though he lives in places like Syria and Iraq and goes to other terrible places, every morning he still gets up at the crack of dawn and goes for his five-mile run. And he was contemplating this verse about how we should all pray without ceasing when he was on his run one morning. And he tells me as he was facing this fork in the road, it had occurred to him that he hadn't prayed about whether or not he should go left or if he should go right because his normal route was just to go left. And so he starts talking to the Lord like he does. And he says, Lord, should I go left or right? My route is normally left. And he starts leaning left. And all of a sudden, an overwhelming urge, an almost audible voice says, right, go right. And so he jumps to the right side of the trail when he hears a rifle crack and a bullet impact a tree that was right where his head was. A sniper had been waiting for him to come by in that position. And if he wouldn't have been praying without ceasing and praying constantly, he might not be alive today. Praying is vitally important to the battle. Now, and the reason why his prayer invites God to enter the fight. That's important because us, like Israel, our enemy is bigger, stronger, and smarter than we could ever imagine. 
I listen to a lot of people talk about spiritual warfare often, and they're kind of presumptuous and maybe a little bit cocky about how they're going to whip the devil. And I pray for them that they don't go into any of those battles where they're facing a bigger, stronger, smarter enemy alone because they're just not going to win. But prayer, prayer allows God to enter the battle and fight for us. One of my favorite pastors, Mark Batterson, says, prayer is the difference between us doing our best and God doing his best. So let's imagine that we have a fight where you're outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned, with my apologies to Hamilton. So I have a volunteer. Haley, let's say I'm your enemy. And we have to fight. Is it a fair fight? I'm kind of a bully, aren't I? Yeah. Right? How many people have, how many of you are cheering for me right now? <laughs> Nobody. You see that? How many want Haley to win? All right. But I'm more experienced. How many combat zones have you been in? None. Oh, okay. How many guys have you punched besides your brother? Oh, don't answer that. All right. All right. <laughs> right? It's not a fair fight. But what would you do if you didn't have to fight your battle? Have someone help me. Have someone help you? Go, go pick somebody. This completely changes the dynamic, doesn't it? <laughs> this is the illustration. If, if we are the church, if we are Haley, and we are in a battle where we're outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned with a bigger enemy that's smarter and better and more experienced, we better invite God to the battle because he's going to win. This... <laughs> this... This is no contest. But guys, you should notice that this is what the church should look like going into battle. But this is also what it looks like to be a husband bringing your family into battle. This is what it looks like being a father bringing your kids into battle. That you are putting your body and your leadership and your spiritual leadership in front of them as you follow Jesus bringing them behind you so that you will win the fight. Or you can do your best on your own. But prayer is the difference between us doing our best, because Haley would do her best, right? She'd probably get a couple of good licks in. <laughs> but prayer is the difference between us doing our best and God doing his best. Why don't you give them a round of applause? <laughs> I'm reminded in John chapter 15 when we think about prayer being the battle that he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can do only a little bit sometimes. Right? No, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. That's why prayer is so important to the fight. It invites God to come in and fight our battles for us. But it also empowers us to do anything else that he wants to have done th through our, our work. Prayer is one of the ways that we abide in Christ and stay connected to him as the vine in battle. Prayer allows us to be united with him and on his side, which is critically different than asking God to be on our side. Have you ever heard that, that we hope that God is on our side? As a chaplain, I hear it quite often. I'll have a commander come in and ask me to pray for something, and he's trying to invoke through an incantation of sorts the deity to fight on his behalf so that the God is on his side. 
Well, that's never the question when we enter into spiritual warfare, especially if we know who the creator of the universe is. It's our job to be on his side. And prayer allows that reconfiguring to happen. A number of months ago, I went down to Fort Leavenworth to go to the Command and General Staff College to um, study a bunch of Army stuff. But the problem is, is that there is a guy that works at Fort Leavenworth that I really, really, really don't like. <laughs> and I've got my reasons. And so I decided to pray about it because we're called to pray for our enemies. And as I'm praying for it, I'm asking God to let me run into him because let me tell you, Lord, what I'm going to tell him. <laughs> and I had this great speech that I had worked out in my one-mile walk between my apartment and the Command and General Staff College. And I built this speech over two or three days of praying every morning to see this guy when I went into the building. And sometime later that week, as I'm in the midst of prayer, the Lord interrupts me and says, Jason, you don't sound like me in this battle. Jason, you see that the nature of my army is that the people that Paul persecuted and killed are going to be the ones that are cheering loudest when he entered the gates of heaven. I love my enemies. I pray for those who persecute me. I bless those who curse me. My ways are not your ways. And eventually through that process, a prayer for my dirty, rotten scoundrel of an enemy, I realized I was looking nothing like Jesus. And I was asking him to be on my side instead of being on his. And that day, God changed the battle in my heart where I began to pray for my enemy and for his salvation and for his grace instead of against it. See, Ephesians 6 says our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and the rulers of this dark world. In other words, the short story of our planet is we've been hijacked by spiritual terrorists that were appointed to do good things, but then Satan became the prince of the power of the air, and this is currently his territory. But we are called to love our enemies in an insurrection from the kingdom of, for the kingdom of God. And he doesn't fight the way we do. The spiritual domain is absolutely important when we think about our battles that we are going through on earth. In, at the Command and General Staff College, we often talk about something called combined warfare or multi-domain operations. And for those of you who don't know, it's the synchronized, it's the synchronized and simultaneous application of air, land, sea, space, and cyber power. This is what makes the United States Army the best, or the military, the best in the world. is because we don't fight one at a time. We fight all at once, together, giving our enemies multiple problems simultaneously in different places. Doesn't that sound like a nightmare? Thank God for the U.S. military. Yeah, and our veterans. But when we get together, we like to have a little sibling rivalry, right? I talk about which domain is better in the fight. Like the army guys are going to advocate for the land domain because that's where we hold territory and you wouldn't have a country without the army, right? The Air Force says, well, you wouldn't be able to hold that land without close air support. And any of us Army guys who have been in combat and needed close air support, thank God for the Air Force. We're grateful for them. The Marines always let us know that they're important. <laughs> and have much better uniforms. Yeah, I get it. Uh, all right. No bitterness or guilt here. You know. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. But as a chaplain, I'm reminded that it's really the spiritual domain 
that's most important. This is where the ultimate battle is won or lost, and Moses understood it right away. Israel may have been the first army to conduct combined warfare or multi-domain operations, fighting with Joshua on the land domain and fighting spiritually with Moses on the spiritual domain. Moses instructs Joshua, who bears the same name as Jesus, If you haven't noticed yet, there's a bunch of foreshadowing going on here that God wants you to pay attention to. Do you know how you say Joshua in Greek? Jesus. Do you know how you say Jesus in Hebrew? Yeshua, Joshua. And so he has Joshua lead some men that he has hand-selected to go into battle. And then knowing that he shouldn't go into the spiritual domain alone, he takes Aaron and her up a hill with him And they end up being essential for the victory. I have an important quote today that says, that staff was really heavy. Moses. Probably. Like, it's not. I don't know. I don't know if the Marines do this, but in Army basic training, if somebody drops a weapon, there is punishment for everybody. Everybody. And one of the favorite punishments of the drill sergeants is to take your weapon and hold it out in front of you until the drill sergeants get tired. Right? Have you ever tried to do that? Like, I was the son of a soldier, and so when something broke in the house and nobody knew what happened to it, my dad had a way of finding that out by lining us three kids up and saying, okay, you don't have to tell me who did it. You just have to hold your arms out in front of you and tell... You want to tell the truth. I can, my, my, my shoulders still burn today when I think about how long I resisted telling my dad that it was me, <laughs> right? Most of the time. But Moses' arms got really tired and it was essential for Aaron and her to be there for him so that he didn't go in to battle alone. Soldiers don't go into battle alone if they can help it. Sometimes they find themselves alone, but they wouldn't choose to be alone. And so Moses, knowing he was going into a spiritual battle, brought his staff and two friends. The staff of God. I love that phrase. Do you know there's a staff that God uses here at Calvary Marietta? The staff of God that God gave Brian to execute battles in the spiritual domain in this community. It's composed of great men and women that go to battle for you and I every day so that the kingdom might come here to Calvary, here to Murrieta and the surrounding areas. I've got a tough question for you. How heavy do you think that staff is? Okay. I'm not saying the staff needs to lose a couple of pounds, okay? But I'm just saying being the senior pastor and having the job of having to hold up just that staff, not to mention everything else he has to do, eventually gets really heavy. Are you supporting the staff of God that has been placed in your life for battle? Do you see the holes in our teams as just volunteer opportunities or, or a call to battle and a call to war? If you understand that we are in the midst of multi-domain operations, that operating a camera, that playing a guitar, that telling the truth, that teaching Sunday school are all acts of war, you will see things much differently. The final lesson that we, we learned here is that God always wins. Amen? Amen. Look, and it's important to note that God is so offended by the Amalekites that he makes a promise to blot them from the face of the earth. He didn't even do that to the nation that held his people captive for 500 years. But here the Amalekites come 
and their first attack is on civilians. And not just civilians, but the elderly and the sick and women and kidnapped wives and kidnapped children. And God says, no, I will not tolerate this. I will personally go to war with you from generation to generation until you are blotted out from under heaven. Do these tactics sound familiar to anybody else? For an Israel that is at war today with Hamas? For those of you who are discouraged with that situation, let me tell you that God promises to blot out Hamas too. Take a listen to Isaiah 60, verses 18. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction, but you will call your wall salvation and your gates praise. Pretty great, huh? But you know what's even better? Do you know what the word for violence is in Arabic and Hebrew? Hamas. The Lord proclaims, no longer will Hamas be heard in your land in the last days, nor ruin or destruction, but you will call your wall salvation and your gates praise. Sometimes it takes a long time for God to fulfill his promises according to our timeline. The battle started with Joshua with the Amalekites, almost ended with Saul and Samuel, but Saul was disobedient. Good thing we never are, right? right? Eventually they were blotted out in the days of Hezekiah, but the spirit of Amalek still reigns today. See, the people keep changing, but the demons stay the same. That's why the spiritual domain is so important. And God promises to blot out the Amalekites, and he does. And God is promising that he will take care of Hamas too. And listen to the words of Charles Spurgeon. God is not like a man where the making and the keeping of a promise are two different things. God will keep his promises. But some of us in the battles in our lives might be saying, but why is it taking so long? Peter tells us that God is not slow in keeping his promises, like some think slowness to be, but rather God is patient so that none might perish and as many as possible come to repentance. See, when, when we really understand Ephesians 6, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, we realize we're not just fighting against terrible people like Hamas, but we are also fighting for Hamas. Jesus loves Hamas too. And his desire is that they might repent and believe and be saved. Ezekiel chapter 33 says, I, the Lord, do not delight in the destruction of the wicked, but they, they would turn from their evil ways and live. But we can't win Hamas for Christ if we are not actively engaging in spiritual warfare and heavy prayer. The most exciting part about this passage is how it foreshadows the decisive victory of Jesus. Let me take you through a couple of the steps. Moses goes up on a hill with a piece of wood where he stretches out his hands for the salvation of God's people. While Jesus, Yahshua, leads his people into the chosen promised land. Do you see the Christology? Moses, who represents the law, couldn't hold up his hands on his own. Works were not good enough to be able to conquer the enemy and go into the promised land. But Yahshua, but Jesus does later lead the people into the promised land and saves them. Later, we see Jesus himself 
goes up onto the hill of Calvary where he is hung on a piece of wood with a man on his left and a man on his right where he stretches out his arms for the salvation of the world where his hands are no longer held up by other men but nailed to a cross that had our names on it so that we might live. And after he rises from the dead, he goes to the people he selected and leads them into war. I don't know what battles you're fighting, but I know that if you're not fighting in the spiritual domain with Jesus, you're going to lose. Prayer is not something that we should set aside for battles or finally go to as a last resort when we've run out of every other resource that we have. If we understand scripture, prayer is the battle. It invites Jesus to lead us and keeps us in line with him. So are you praying like your marriage depends on it? It does. Are you praying like your kids' eternal lives depend on it? They do. Are you praying like your church, your school, your pastor, his staff, and our nation depends on it? It does. And so we need to continue to fight in the domain, in the domain that matters most, the spiritual domain. Let's pray. Holy God, I pray that when we fight, we will fight on our knees in total submission to you, calling upon you to enter into the battles of our lives. God, I pray that you would reign in the battle with Hamas. God, I pray that you would reign in the battle and become victorious in the battles against other terrorists. God, I pray that you would be invited into the terror in our hearts and in our minds. God, I pray that you would enter the battle for our marriage and for the salvation of our children. And I pray that you would change our perspective on prayer so that we understand it is not something that we should just do sometimes, but this is the very act of war and how we are called to fight with you, in you. In Jesus' name I pray.